The word clean means to be free of guilt, free of dirt, free of stain, free of unwanted matter, uncontaminated. I love that word, uncontaminated, spotless, guiltless. And this is my favorite, free of shame, free of shame. Oh, how our souls long to be clean. How our souls long to be spotless. How we crave to have no shame and no guilt. And here's the good news. There's nothing too dirty that God cannot make worthy because through the finished work of Christ on the cross, he's washed us in mercy. I want you to listen to what God said to Isaiah. Isaiah 118, come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you're stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool. And Paul, the apostle Paul explains how. In Titus chapter three, he says this, verse three, at one time, We too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. In other words, we were dirty. We lived in malice, envy, being hated and hating one another. I love this. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus, our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Wow, isn't that amazing? That's what you call good news. That no matter how dirty you are, no matter how dirty your mind may be, no matter how dirty your hands may be, no matter how dirty your life has been, no matter what you've done, through the blood of Christ, you can be made spotless and clean. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. For several weeks, we have been in a series called The Great Escape. We've been looking at things in our lives, some of them good, some of them not so good, that enter into our lives and if we're not careful, they can take us hostage. They can steal away our intimacy with God. They can lead us on a path astray from the heart of God. We've looked at things like anxiety and how anxiety takes us hostage. We've looked at ambition. We've looked at our appearance. We've looked at last week how religion can even take us away from the heart of God. Today, I wanna look at the topic of guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. Guilt, by definition, is the cognitive and emotional response or remorse a person experiences when they've realized they've compromised a standard of conduct, when they've broken or violated some universal moral standard. Shame is the painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by this consciousness that that started with foolish behavior. And here's the thing about it. Normally, guilt is what a person feels internally, a guilty conscience, whereas shame is what a person feels when that guilt becomes public knowledge to someone else. So we're guilty internally and we get ashamed externally. So the question is, what is the reason for guilt? I'm just going to give you a passage to refer to. We're not going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight that one because we're going to spend our time today in Psalm 51. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. But 2 Samuel chapter 11 gives us a great picture of the reason of shame and guilt. See, the reason for shame and guilt is because we've done something or are party to something that our conscience knows isn't right. Whether we believe in God or not, we know we've broken some rule or we've done something egregious towards someone else. Now, throughout the Bible, we encounter person after person after person who experiences shame and guilt. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Cain in the book of Genesis, all the way to the woman at the well and when when Jesus was in Samaria in John chapter four. We see it in Samson's life, but we also see it in Zacchaeus' life when Jesus goes through Jericho. 
And, and those are just a couple of instances. But the reality is that shame and guilt seemingly are crouching at every corner ready to pounce on us. But there's one man in particular that he is the king of blowing it. If there's ever been anyone in history who blew it more than this guy, I don't know who that is. This guy blew it big time. Lust, greed, adultery, denial, conspiracy, disregard, even murder. Even murder. And yet in the midst of his earned guilt and shame, God makes him clean. God washes the slate. Of course, I'm referring to King David. The man that at one point in time was said to be a man after God's own heart. But something happened in David's life. In a moment of weakness, in a moment of spiritual laziness, he broke nearly every command. Think about that. Nearly every command. In fact, he actually broke half of them in one fell swoop. Well, most of you probably know the story of David. If you don't, let me kind of bring you up to speed. Uh, we're going to pick it up in 2 Samuel chapter 11 because what happened in David's life that led him astray started with one bad choice. It starts out and says, when kings go off to war, David stayed home. <laughs> While his army was off to war, David, for some reason, stayed behind. And when he did, he found himself in a place he should have never been. See, that's usually when it starts for us. We find ourselves in a position we should never be in. And then it kind of goes downhill from there. So if you know the story, David walked out on his veranda when he was staying home when he should have been off to war. And he's walking around and all of a sudden he looks over the edge and one of his neighbor's wife is bathing. Beautiful woman. Instead of turning away, instead of turning his thoughts away, he calls for her, brings him to his bed and commits adultery. Now, he probably thought this one night stand will just be a one time instance and it will never be an issue. Just like so many times we think, you know, if I just do this one time, it won't be a big deal. If I tell this lie one time, it won't matter. If I cheat on this test one time, if I cheat that my taxes one time, it's no big deal. But it was big deal. Because see, here's the thing about sin. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it always costs you more than you want to pay. Every time. See, what happened to David was probably within a month or six weeks, he gets this notice that Bathsheba says, uh, David, I'm pregnant. So his one night stand turned into a lifetime of turmoil, a lifetime of pain. So what does David do? Does he come clean? Nope. He thinks he can cover it up. So he, he gets this brilliant idea. I'm going to call her husband, Uriah, one of, my, one of my generals. I'm going to call him home and I'm going to tell him, hey, have a night with your wife. And then when the baby's born, no, I don't think anything of it. The only problem is Uriah was not just a godly man. Uriah was a man who wanted to honor his king and in no way did he want to dishonor his troops. So when he comes home, he says, I'm not going to spend the night with my wife. I'm going to, I'm going to stay on guard. So David's like, what am I going to do? So desperate, David sends him to the front of the line to make sure that he's killed in battle. And then he takes Bathsheba to be his wife. You see the story, it goes, <laughs> it's, it's one bad decision after another bad decision after another bad decision. And what ultimately happens is that in one fell swoop, David forgets God, he covets his neighbor's wife, he committed adultery, he committed murder, and he lied breaking five of the Ten Commandments. All because when King should have gone off the war, he stayed home. He put himself in a position he should have never been in. Can I tell you what I think David learned the hard way? Well, since I have the microphone, I will tell you. David learned that the devil doesn't fight fair. In case that's new to you, the demonic, they never fight fair, ever. See, the demonic will tell you, oh, you can get away with this. You deserve it. Everybody else is doing it and you might as well be doing it too. And they're not getting caught. Nobody's doing anything to them. So you might as well do it too. 
The only problem is the second you do it, he'll then say, oh, you'll never get away with this. He'll say, you've just destroyed your life. You've hurt these people. You, 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 God will never forgive you. I know that none of us in this room have ever heard that, have we? See, here's what the demonic will do. The demonic will trip you up and then blame you for falling. And so for the next year, David was caught in this guilt and in the shame and, and, and in this conviction and, and he drug it around with him. It was literally killing him because he couldn't bear the thought of what he had done against God and what he had done to other people. His conscience was eating him alive. He was right where the devil wanted him. By the way, this would be a good time to explain what I think is a really important truth. All of us by nature are sinful. There's not one of us that's righteous. Not one of us. We're sinners by nature and we're sinners by choice. And even after salvation, even after Christ comes into our life, we still have this thing called flesh that craves to be satisfied because while our soul has been redeemed, while we've been justified and we're in the process of being sanctified and, the way, and waiting to be glorified, our flesh still craves the things of this world. Galatians 5 says there's a battle that's waging on inside of us. The flesh sets this desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're in opposition to one another so that you cannot do the things that you please. Now, here's the thing. God allows guilt and shame. In fact, guilt and shame can be your best friend if... You see when guilt and shame and conviction comes, you see it as God reaching out to you to restore you back to relationship. But if you see it as God, as God being ready to curse you or hurt you, we tend to cover it up and run the opposite way. Instead of running to God, we run from God. So for a year after sin, David ran through the stop sign of shame, ran through the stop sign of guilt, and he listened to his flesh, he listened to Satan, and he ran from God's grace. This same God that, that had met him on the hillside when he was tending sheep, this same God that was with him when he slew Goliath, this same God that was with him when he, as he was running the kingdom and overcoming the Philistines, this same God that he knew who loved him, he was running from me. See, that's what happens with guilt and shame. When we see it, instead of as God's gift to draw us to him, when we see it as something that we need to cover up and we run from God. One pastor friend of mine was, was talking about this and I love what he said. He goes, there's something, there's one thing God will never accept as it pertains to sin. And that's an excuse. I love this next statement. You can't, you cannot try to alibi your way out of sin. It just makes the pain of guilt and the infection of shame worse. Let me put it a different way. When we try to cover our sin, God is forced to uncover it. But when we uncover our sin through confession, God is obligated by the cross to cover it. He does it by his grace and mercy. So what's the reason? What's the reason for shame and guilt? It's because we, we choose to do things that we know God doesn't want us to do. Whether we know it consciously or subconsciously, we do things that we know break the rule of God, break the, con break, break the code of conduct of man. But instead of seeing that shame and guilt as a pathway back to restoration, we see it as a means to run from God. So how, what, what would be the remedy? Well, thankfully, just like with us, God didn't abandon David. He didn't condemn him, but pursued him to rescue him. In fact, if you know the story, in chapter 11, when, after he blows it, 
he, he's, he's trying to do his own thing for a year and God finally is convicting him, convicting him, convicting him. He's kind of just got right, going right through it. So God says, I've got to amp it up a little bit. And he sends the prophet Nathan to him. And Nathan comes and knocks on his door and says, King, let me tell you a story. It tells him a story about how someone takes advantage of someone else's sheep. And David is furious. And then Nathan says, Dave, that's you. You did that to Uriah. And all of a sudden in that moment, David falls under incredible conviction. He literally experiences brokenness and he turns back to God at that point. And all this is encapsulated in Psalm 51. In fact, this is my favorite Psalm because I think I pray this prayer and come back to God more times than not through this Psalm. But I want you to listen to verses one through eight. Have mercy on me, God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my sins and my sin is always before me. You ever feel that way? I know what I'm doing wrong. It's right there. It's staring me in the face. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justifies when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You desired, sin, you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. This is incredible right here. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. What an incredible, incredible request of God. See, I believe in this psalm we find a remedy for dealing with guilt and shame that wants to take us away from God. And I think there are are four things that we can do from this text. And I'm going to use the acrostic acts. If we act in this way, we can deal with guilt and shame when it comes our way because it's going to come. The first thing he says is accept your responsibility. Accept responsibility. See, if we're ever going to co- overcome guilt and shame, it will require that we accept who we are at our core and what we have done because of who we are at our core. And that is that we're, we're because of, of sin, because we were infected in, with sin in the fall, we are incapable of doing anything that will satisfy the holiness of God. And so as a result, we're sinners who are in need of being saved. The problem is most of us think too highly of ourselves. Most of us think, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. At least I'm better than that person over there. I, I'm not that bad. So God, you know, you, you should accept me because I'm really not that bad of a guy. The only problem is, is that God says it doesn't matter how good you think you are, you're still tainted with this thing called sin. And so you're, you're born with an infection that requires a divine cure. David understood this. Listen to what he says. Have mercy on me, God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my sins, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me. Now watch this. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. What is David doing? David's acknowledging the reason that he stepped across the line of God's holiness. And it's because of his fleshly propensity to sin. Yes, he knew God. But he also knew that the reason he broke the rule of God, broke the heart of God in this matter, was because of his propensity in his flesh to sin. So he's not excusing it. Instead, he's taking personal responsibility for willfully choosing to sin. He admits, God, I ignored you. I defied your word. I defied your heart. And he's confessing that he has sinned because he is sinful, because he is a sinner by nature and by choice. I love these three words in the Hebrew because I think they explain this really well. 
Transgressions, iniquity, and sin. Listen to this. Transgression, the Hebrew word here, is pesha. It means to intentionally cross a forbidden boundary. It's the old, do, I, don't, I dare you to cross that line. And we kind of go, okay. And we step across the line. Even though we know it's forbidden, we step across that line. It's to step across the line with the intent of being rebellious. So when David says, comes to him, he says, here are my transgressions. He's saying, God, I know you've established a rule and I intentionally stepped across it knowing that I was going to be defiant, that I was going to be disobedient. Then he uses the word iniquity. The word iniquity means to have a perverted or depraved nature. It's referring to the fact that I am who I am as a result of the fall. But that's not an excuse to sin. It's the recognition that I have a propensity of sinning. And then the word sin here is simply to commit the act of missing the mark of God's perfection. So all here in these three words, David says this. He says, look, God, the reason I committed this sin, the reason I missed the mark of being perfect is for two reasons. One is because I was born with the nature to sin. And I had this flesh that craves the sin. And I, by choice, intentionally stepped across that line. So I want you to know I'm taking personal responsibility for my sin. Not just my nature to sin, but for my action of sinning. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to wipe the slate clean. See, we're all sinful by nature and we're sinful by choice. We all sin because of our, fla- our fallen flesh, because it craves to be satisfied. And even though we have a new identity in Christ, even though the old is gone, behold, all things become new, I still have not had my flesh redeemed, so I will fight with my flesh all through my life until the day of my redemption. I'm a child of God who still has a struggle with a flesh that wants to go against God. And that's what David's acknowledging here. Now here's the good news. God understands that we have a nature to sin. He also understands that we have a need for a savior. And so what he did was he gave us the cross. And so when we by faith receive his grace, he not only rescues and redeems us from sin, but he deposits the Holy Spirit into our lives. He seals us with the Holy Spirit to help us to live by grace just as we've been saved by grace. So he gives us everything that we need for life and godliness. He literally invests himself in us. And I love this thought. So the same cross that saves us is the same cross that keeps us. But it requires that we walk not in our flesh, but in the spirit. So the first thing we have to do is we have to accept responsibility. The second thing, we have to confess our guilt. Look what David does. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justifies when you judge. Confession occurs when we honestly look at our actions and our attitudes and we look at them in light of God's holiness and we identify that the sin or the encumbrance that has tripped us up, that separates us from intimacy with God, relationship with God, we're saying, God, I admit my awareness to this sin. When 1 John says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, he's saying that you're coming into agreement with God God, this is not right. This is sin. This breaks your moral law. This breaks your your spiritual law. I like the way one guy said it. (laughs) This is great. Confession is letting God know that we know that he knows that we know that what we did was wrong and not in alignment with his will, will, heart, and word. Say that again fast. Confession is letting God know that we know that he knows that we know that what we did was wrong and not in alignment with his word, his will, and his heart. Now, here's the big thing about confession. This is huge. I think sometimes we miss this. When our, while our sin always affects, affects, and infects others, 
Our sin is only against God. I cannot sin against you. My sin can affect you. My sin can hurt you. My sin can cost you. But I can't sin against you. Do you know why? If you're perfect, please raise your hand. If you're holy and without sin from the start, you've never had any tainting of your life, raise your hand. Oh, see, that's the problem. All of us are sinners. I can't sin against you because you're not perfect and holy. But I can sin against God because he is perfect and holy. But my sin against him can affect every person and every aspect of my life. And so he looks at God and says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. God, I have broken your standard. I have broken, I've, I, I've, I've intruded upon your holiness. Why is this important to understand? It's really quite simple. It's because when we realize that, when we realize that our sin against God, I can't use other people as my excuse for my behavior. Nor do I use them as the standard by which I measure holiness. You know, if I go, if I go to, to death row and look at this guy who's murdered someone and raped and pillaged and done all kinds of horrible things, and they're my standard of holiness, then I'm really, really good. The problem is, is that it doesn't address what we might consider the little sins, the little foxes in the vineyard that are destroying our own lives. And so it's critical that we understand that our sin is against God, but it affects other people because only God is holy. So we confess our guilt. We come to God and we say, God, I have sinned. Oh, I, somewhat, my, my best friend over here might not think it's a sin, but my conscience knows it is. And so God, I come and confess my guilt against you who is the holy standard, not my friend. The third thing we do is we trust God's mercy. If we wanna deal with shame and guilt, we have to take responsibility, confess our guilt, and then trust in God's mercy. This is the most important part of this whole message. While confession is realizing and admitting to God that what we did and we name it before God, it's our turning away from that. It's our repentance which matters. Repentance is to turn about, to turn around, to walk in the opposite direction. And so if I'm going towards sin, it means to turn and to walk towards God, to walk towards what's right and righteous. It doesn't just mean to turn. It means to turn from sin to God. Well, in David's prayer, we discover a depth that many of us have missed. It, we may have missed it because we don't understand it. We may have missed it because it's never been explained to us. But he explains repentance and forgiveness because he absolutely throws himself on God's mercy. He takes responsibility for his actions. He embraces guilt and he accepts that he needs God's help and only God's help will be sufficient to cleanse him, wash him and blot out his sin. I want you to read, listen to this again because this is to me is the most important part. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. That in itself, you need to underline and you need to, you, you, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Three words, cleanse with hyssop, that phrase. He says, to blot out and to wash. The word cleanse means to purge completely. It literally means to cut away, to cut, to cut out. So when you and I go, if you go to the doctor and you have cancer, how much of the cancer do you want him to get? You want him to get 99% of it or do you want to get 100%? You want to get all of it. He literally, to cut out. David was begging God, take every hint, every speck. Don't leave a single atom of sin in my life. But notice how he says to do it. This is what's so powerful. He says, cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Do you know what hyssop was? Hyssop is this little spongy plant that 
the Israelites would, the, the, would take into the Holy of Holies and when they would make a sacrifice, they would dip this hyssop plant and use it to paint the blood over the mercy seat. In fact, the first time we see this is in Exodus chapter 12, verse 22. You remember the Passover? They, they make a sacrifice. They were to take the hyssop and take it and paint the blood over the doorpost so that the death angel, when it came by, would pass over them. So when David comes and says, cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean, he literally is saying, God, only you can cover my sin. It's only through the blood of a sacrifice that the death angel might pass over my guilt, the guilt of my life, the shame of my life. And so as a man who is guilty, who's without defense, he throws himself on the mercy of God and on the mercy of the sacrifice of God. It says, God, my only hope of being clean is through the blood of a sacrifice. And so for good measure, he says, also wash him and blot out. And these two also play into this factor. To wash means to make clean through sacrifice. See, David recognized that for forgiveness and restoration to take place, it would require an act of God. To blot out, which literally, it, 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 does, it means more than to erase from a book. It means that your re- record is completely expunged. What is David asking? David's saying, God, cut every speck of sin. All that I did, this, this murder, this conspiracy, this, this lust, all these things that I did, the adultery. Lord, cut out every bit of it. Every bit of it. Don't leave a speck inside of me. And through your sacrifice, make me clean. And more so than that, for the record, expunge it to where it's as if it's never existed. It never happened. Do you know what we call that? A miracle. Anytime you and I go to God and we say, God, would you forgive me? When we confess our sin, knowing that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, what we're doing is we're asking God for a miracle. And what's amazing is that he provides it. He provides this miracle. Guilt and shame can only be cleansed, can only be expunged by an act of God's mercy. Nothing more and nothing less. Which brings us to the fourth thing. After we confess our guilt and we come and we trust God for his mercy and his mercy alone, David then, he sought God's restoring power. So look what he says. Because of what God has done, he says, create in me a pure heart. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast your presence from me or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This, it, this is actually my favorite part. It's my favorite part because God does something that only God can do for David. He gives him a new heart and he gives him a new purpose. And only God can do that. It's a miracle. Here's the cool thing. So when you get to that, he says, created me a clean heart. Do you know that that word create is the same exact word used in Genesis chapter one, when God created the heavens and the earth. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created something out of nothing. David is coming, he's saying, God, I don't want a renovated heart. I don't want a reformed heart. I want a new heart, a new heart. Do you know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter five, that when we come to Christ and we receive him as our savior, it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, behold, all things become new. We're not, we're not just this old simple person who's been renovated, we are a new person. 
The old is gone. Behold, all things become new. That's what, Paul, that's what David is asking. He says, God, create something new. Don't renovate me. He recognized there was nothing in him that was useful to God. And so he said, God, give me a heart that's suitable to carry around this grace and this mercy that you've given to me that I don't deserve. And then he says, restore to me. It literally means give me your favor. Put your hand upon me. See, David was saying, Lord, I used to be intimate with you, but I lost that intimacy because of this sin. So when you give me a new heart, would you also give me favor? Would you allow me to walk closely together with you again? And of course, God did that. It's beautiful. So let me ask you, are you tired of dragging around guilt and shame? Are you tired of dragging around the remorse? Have you missed the fact that the reason God gave you that was to draw you to him and draw you to the cross? Because the cross is the only thing, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the only thing that can truly take care of all of our guilt and shame. I wanna close this morning by sharing a video with you I think illustrates this point. And when it's done, I'll come back up. Watch this. <laughs> 